I'm Edgar Majerovic, professor at the Department of Economics at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte and the graduate program in economics at the same university. I would like to welcome you to the fourth episode of our seminar entitled Automation and Digitalization in Contemporary Capitalism. The seminar is jointly organized by three research groups in different Brazilian universities, namely the research group in the political economy of development, Grupo de Pesquisa em Economia Política do Desenvolvimento, at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, the research group in Economy, Technology and Society, Núcleo de Estudo em Economia, Tecnologia e Sociedade, at the Federal University of Ceará, and the DG Labor Research Lab at the Unicinos University. Today, our guest speaker is Svetlana Matvienko, who kindly accepted our invitation to present and discuss her most recent book, co-authored by Nick Dyer Whitford, entitled Cyber War and Revolution, Digital Subterfuge in Global Capitalism. Svetlana Matvienko is an assistant professor of critical media analysis in the School of Communication at the Simon Fraser University. She writes about practices of resistance and mobilization, digital militarism, dis and misinformation, internet story, cybernetics, psychoanalysis, post-humanism, the Soviet and the post-Soviet technopolitics, nuclear cultures, including the Chernobyl zone of exclusion. She is a co-author of two collections, The Imaginary F and Lacan and the Posthuma. Her co-authored book, Cyber Wars Revolution, is the topic of our discussion today. The book is a winner of the 2019 Book Award of the Science, Technology and Art in International Relations section of the International Studies Association and of the Canadian Communication Association 2020. Gertrude J. Robinson Book Prize. So, we will start with Vitlana's presentation and afterwards we will have a Q&A session. So, Vitlana, thank you very much for being today with us and you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Esther, for this kind presentation. And I want to thank all the organizers and everyone with, who is involved in supporting this event. And of course, I want to thank already to the audience and to your interest in this work. And I really look forward to this conversation. So uh, at this moment, I would like to share my slides with you. So this presentation is based, of course, on the book. And I will tell you about uh, some kind of major uh, ideas there. Uh, but also, I will begin with the notion of cyber war, the notion that we, uh, with my co-author, Nir Dyer Visifert, uh, redefined in, in this book. But then I want to end with another notion that I'm trying to develop on the basis of this work in my forthcoming uh, article. Okay, and this notion is communicative militarism. So I will lead you very slowly towards the end where I will try to define and theorize this notion of communicative militarism. If you read the book, you probably remember how uh, discussing the genealogy of cyber war we find it quite interesting, but may, maybe not too surprising, that the notion of cyber war is not unrelated to kind of like this whole uh, discussion of cyber world or presentation of cyber world in the pop culture. So one, uh, and pop culture indeed really flourishes our imagination. And sometimes as in this case, we could tell that even military imagination can be impacted <laughs> in a certain way by certain sci-fi scenarios or certain political scenarios that come from fiction. So one of the uh, kind of known sources, sources that really uh, draw attention to uh, some potential, potential new type of war in the cyberspace was 
a film and actually it was a teenage movie right so a movie for teenagers uh, made in the states in 1983 and that was a war games if you haven't seen that movie so it's is its topic was pretty kind of simple so it's of course about the teenagers who broke broke into pentagon system and were very close to kind of almost accidental uh, starting of a war, of a world war. Uh, the story has it that uh, some people from American government, including Reagan, uh, were quite <laughs> um, impacted by this whole idea, this, this potentiality and some important American military defense programs that were focused on this new domain, cyber, uh, were kind of developed with a new attention, with new funding, actually, uh, basically after this movie. We cannot forget about William Gibson as well, who is a Canadian sci-fi writer and his contribution is also very important because uh, it is in his earlier work, uh, in his uh, 1982 short sci-fi story, uh, which is a kind of uh, remain really unknown, didn't get that much attention, but that's where he actually uh, first introduced the word cyberspace. The word cyberspace became really known and really drew attention after the publication of Gibson's uh, fa famous novel, New Romancer, uh, in 1984. And that's when it really entered the public debate, public discussion, etc. cetera. Uh, the publication of uh, an essay by a group of very interesting kind of very diverse uh, group of people from Esther Dyson to Alvin Toffler. So some of them were um, businessmen and women and others kind of futurist thinkers of technology and uh, economy as Toffler. So this essay was published basically the same, uh, not the same, but uh, in, in, the, in a decade after William Gibson uh, text. And that's where we see how the, uh, 10 years later, the notion of cyberspace um, becomes uh, like is imagined in, in a particular kind of realm, independent realm, right? So where something like the American dream can be uh, realized, right? So it's, a, it, it's presented as a realm of freedom, as a realm of new possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, uh, we cannot forget about John Perry Barlow and his very famous Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace written two years after in 1996 in response to Bill Clinton's attempts kind of to regulate cyberspace, to, pay, uh, to, to set certain regulations, init very initial regulations, but still. So at that time in the 80s and 90s, and especially in, 90, in the 90s, so cyberspace is presented as a space of freedom. Uh, and we also see that parallel to that, um, in the groups close to the government, and here uh, I'm showing you a clip from uh, the website of Rand Corporation, which is a kind of a think tank uh, also associated with government and business, right? So, and it is on the website of Rand Corporation in 1992, uh, uh, two people, two military analysts publish an article who really alerted everyone and presented a potential of something like cyber war, of some militarism in that kind of new realm as a real serious threat. So this article is called Cyber War is Coming. That's we're still all very much in, let's say, kind of, uh, we'll stay a little bit with this slide, 
very much in a, some discussion format at that time, right? So it's still the time of the debates, questions, kind of thinking about certain technological and political possibilities associated with this new type of militarism, this new type of war. Uh, while nothing really was happening that could be identified as a real act of war, right? So still we, we are having, we are dealing with the time of research, thinking, but also funding of certain research, funding of new groups, funding of new um, governmental projects. If we are to identify some cases of this new type of war, we need to think about 2007 and 2008. And these two cases um, both have to do with the realm of the post-Soviet Union. Um, and uh, one of them uh, happened in um, Estonia in 2007 and another in Georgia in 2008. In Estonia, it was pretty interesting. So there was um, a certain kind of ideological and political tension uh, between different groups. Some of them are pro-Estonian and others, we could say like, you know, nostalgically pro-Soviet or pro-Russian groups who had a debate about the kind of the placement of uh, um, a monument. This monument had, of course, uh, very strong Soviet ideologies attached to it, and that was a monument to the unknown soldier, of course, uh, referring to the Second World War. Uh, so where to place this monument? In the, center, um, in the central part of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, or somewhere in more remote locations, some, somewhere uh, in the military cemetery, for example. And th this debate was so strong and so kind of active that um, certain groups, today we call them hackers, right, attacked uh, a lot of uh, Estonian governmental and other economic kind of banking websites, etc. So this was basically what the first attack that we can identify in, in terms of today's understanding of cyber war. Something similar happened in Georgia a year later. The difference was that in Estonian case, there was no um, kind of military context, right? Um, but in Georgia, there was an ongoing conflict, a war with Russia uh, over Abkhazia. And at that time, something very similar happened. So there were uh, many uh, DDoS attacks, distributed denial, denial of se se server uh, service attacks um, that were identified that they're coming from Russian IP addresses and uh, Georgian um, commission who studied this case uh, also lists a number of reasons why they consider actually this is coming from Russia, because as you know, it's very difficult to identify certain uh, acts of hacking, right? Even IP address can be in a certain way manufactured, right? So you need a very complex set of markers that would actually uh, allow you to uh, authenticate a certain act. But this was sort of uh, authenticated as, as uh, coming from Russia. So in, in, in this case, so we have a military scenario, we have a scenario of war, right? And another is completely peaceful. Um, and both things became kind of very important for today's understanding of cyber war because it can uh, explode in the center of war, right? In the context of war, or it can be completely unrelated to certain physical location of war and can uh, happen in completely peaceful scenario. That's why uh, analytics uh, speak about a shifting battlefield, right? So the war became kind of really uh, uh, fluctuous, right? So moving, etc., etc. In terms of scholarship, 
uh, about cyber war in that time. So we are speaking about early thousands and uh, till 2010, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> one of the first books um, was written by Richard Clark, who was a security specialist and uh, advisor on both Bush and Clinton administration. So, and this book was very similar to the article uh, that I showed you, Cyber War is Coming. It was also kind of really warning about this new potential of cyber weapons, a new poten potential of new military threats, et cetera, and basically asking to raise fundings. And of course, this book and the uh, activity, the impact and influence of Richard Clark himself, again, who was a close to the government of the United States figure, really did a job and uh, funding of all sorts of research teams and even some sort of a cyber army um, really happened. Some like years even later after this, uh, Thomas Reed, uh, uh, a war scholar, uh, wrote a book with a critique of this sort of gestures, and the book was called Cyber War Will Not Take Place, uh, where he was precisely really worried by the fact that uh, what this raising um, kind of uh, paranoia uh, about cyber war leads to financialization of certain projects and in this, in this certain way, of course, like basically creation, right? So what you are afraid of, you actually create even more possibility for it to happen. And so that was a kind of the gesture that Thomas Reed was trying to make intellectually by uh, critically writing about this, not that he completely denied such possibility. And finally, I mean, there were, of course, a little kind of like more books, but still not so many addressing this topic. Uh, and one uh, book that really was important, for example, for Nick and I, when we were working on this book and very close to our kind of spirit and understanding of the events, that book was The Real Cyber War, written by Sean Powells and Michael Yablonski. And that was the first book that actually drew attention to political economy of cyber war, and um, um, uh, which uh, from which we also learned a lot and uh, continued that conversation. When we speak, when we speak about cyber war, when we research cyber war, uh, everyone who does it uh, knows that. It's very difficult to talk to, to discuss, and of course, because it's very difficult to imagine and visualize. And here is a snapshot uh, from uh, Norse uh, software, which is a computer program that allegedly allows you to see the real time uh, DDoS attacks coming from certain parts of the world to other parts of the world. It immediately lists the number of attacks, their destination, the country of origin, and all other things. And if you look at this map, you immediately, you kind of like don't see anything new, right? You still see almost kind of like divided world. To use a little bit of meme language, we could say that uh, because of this difficulty to talk about it and to visualize it, uh, many narratives about cyber war fall into this so-called new Cold War paradigm, right? So when we want, whether we want it or not, we kind of like returned in this old framework and, and think about cyber war as uh, basically something very similar to Cold War, to this divided uh, world and certain groups, uh, certain parties uh, fighting uh, one another. However, it's very problematic, right? Because as we know, Cold War was very much ideological and economic, uh, like was based on the ideological and economic tension. Um, some groups socialists, some capitalists, right? So basically it was, we could say like maybe simplifying, it was the tension, the struggle between socialism and capitalism. Uh, however, today, right, this division cannot be drawn and even such countries as China uh, having uh, identifying itself as 
like communists, for example, right? So at the same time, are strong participants of the neoliberal market, and therefore, um, like this very kind of like hybrid situations, they basically make impossible to see the straight line. So these camps are very difficult to imagine today. Uh, and at the same time, we can see um, that different countries uh, put some work into creation, something of like a military units, cyber military units, sometimes officially recognized as such, and in other cases, not recognized as such, right? Uh, for example, Russian, uh, the Internet Research Agency, right? So it's it's not positioned as any, you know, government government sponsored military unit. Uh, it's funded through kind of some other different sources, etc. But it acts on the side, let's say, of uh, Russian government ideology, right? Or we can think about United States Cyber Command, which is more official uh, um, unit, right? Created in 2009, for example, right? So there are some other things uh, as Cyber Caliphate, for example, which is uh, not governmental, but yet... Uh, so it, it, in other words, it's quite difficult to uh, very clearly explain their allegiances, right? But they exist. But what's important for our understanding of cyber war is that we do not see it necessarily associated with governments and even with such uh, hacker units. Uh, in fact, we see it as a much more complex event where, um, uh, in addition to certain uh, kind of state aggression, state cyber aggression, we see uh, a lot of random actors um, and uh, also sometimes cooperations between states that come together just for, let's say, one project. One of the typical examples of that was the case of Stackswarm, uh, which uh, was disabled <clears throat> in uh, around 2010-2012 discovered and disabled, which was an art of state uh, program, uh, but manually inserted um, in the technology uh, of um, uh, Iran's uranium enrichment plan outside the city of Natanz. Uh, allegedly in order to prevent building a nuclear, a nuclear weapons. So they, the researchers say, and Kim Zetter, one of the researchers that we uh, studied and quoted in our book, claims that it was uh, a joint project of US and Israeli uh, intelligence services. We can also think about some attacks on critical infrastructure that um, were not even identified as such. And a very interesting case, and that's where we can really think about this murky, blurry nature of contemporary cyber war, which really is different from any kind of uh, old types of war, right? Where we know the parties. Here we don't know the parties. And uh, even in Ukraine, there was a very interesting case <clears throat> several years ago when there was a huge DDoS attack on the um, uh, critical infrastructure um, uh, and many cities in Ukraine um, remained without power. However, nobody recognized it as a hacker, hacking attack. It, would, it looked to people, and I talked to many of them, it looked like some scheduled kind of short uh, power shutdowns, which sometimes Ukrainian government did at that time to economize, right? So in basically uh, like 600 uh, smaller uh, cities and villages were left without power, and none of them knew that it was actually a cyber attack. So this is, again, towards the nature of cyber wars that sometimes it's difficult to recognize. Uh, 
Another aspect, now I'm going through certain examples that show how different cyber war can be or is from uh, typical other wars, right? So here, uh, the example that shows the role of such sources as even like Wikipedia or Google, right? Where we get the information and some mistakes and the trust towards the sources is so huge that it's very difficult to impact what people think. Here is the case, a uh, very known case of Nicaragua, Costa Rica, border dispute where the dispute happened because certain things were just incorrectly shown uh, online through google maps and wikipedia and that led to a conversation that the border uh, sort of set wrong or another very interesting case from 2016 <clears throat> uh, where uh, different devices were hacked for computer power, also with the help of distributed denial of service attack. And this case is important because it shows that in many cases, um, how computer power became a new resource for war. And what uh, uh, the, the, um, the different type of these devices whose computer power was hijacked was very interesting. It was very diff different, right? So it was a were printers, routers, and even uh, <clears throat> baby monitors. And this case exemplifies uh, the fact that cyber war is not somewhere remote, right? So cyber war is a new tension. It's a new activity that comes through literally our bedrooms. Uh, the informa information uh, was hacked or even computer po computing power was hacked even of sex toys, right? So any kind of smart device became potentially a resource, right? Either for data to use it as leverage afterwards or for computer computing power. So here um, I am referring to the work of Benjamin Bratton and his fantastic book, The Stack on Software, on so Software and Sovereignty, where he identified, where he kind of was looking for a new way to speak about the architecture of the internet. And he, in this book, he defined certain layers and said that the internet is in fact um, kind of the relation between these different layers. Uh, the internet became, begins with the earth as platform, as a physical platform with all its physical possibilities, capacities. Then there is cloud, city, internet address, particular interface, but then there is a user. User itself, uh, herself or himself, is one of the layers of this very complex assemblage. Um, <clears throat> What's interesting in this work, so this presentation of the internet is very impressive and uh, I really recommend looking at this if you haven't. But what's interesting about all this work is that um, he mentions only in passing in, on one tiny footnote uh, that this whole idea of the internet as layered stack, that it comes from actually US military uh, researches <clears throat> and there it was imagined as a tool for war. War is not the focus of Benjamin Bratton analysis, but here with this little reference, uh, we were quite excited to see that it has, actually has military origin. And this slide might be familiar to you because it comes from uh, those slides leaked by Edward Snowden. And that's where we see a very similar <clears throat> understanding of the internet and how the US military worked, right? So, or, or, or maintained to did cyber war acts, thinking of internet as the system of these layers. So indeed, cyber war, oh, uh, internet stack is a tool for cyber war fi fighting. In our book, <clears throat> so now just to sum up a little bit, in our book, we define cyber war looking and thinking of its complexity. So, and its complexity uh, also based on the variety of these different acts of aggression or militarism. And some of them are extremely conscious and others are quite 
unconscious and in many ways the user is involved uh, in the acts of cyber war very often on quite unconscious level. So we say that uh, acts typical for today's cyber war are different types of hacking, espionage always, denial of service attacks that I gave a number of examples, critical infrastructure targeting malware, viral propaganda, and of course, online psychological warfare, changing people's opinions and so on. And this new type of cyber war can be uh, <clears throat> distinct from or preliminary to or simultaneous with other forms of hostility. So, uh, for example, it can be uh, it can be uh, linked to a particular act of militarism on the ground or not. It can be remote in time from this act, or it what it can precede it, or it can happen afterwards, right? So, but it's very important to see very often see and search for a certain kinetic. Uh, act of war. Very often it is there. Often, maybe not in the same time frame, but somehow there is a relation. What's also important, and this is the uh, even though as you see how deeply in our book we engaged with the discussions and debates about new type of aggression that was already going on between security specialists and etc. So what was very important for us is is to take away to take this term from security specialist and give it a political economic framework. <clears throat> so in this sense, we uh, offered our definition of cyber war as a manifestation of the recurrent technological revolutions by which capital periodically renews itself. <clears throat> And we know that all these uh, technological revolutions really meant a lot for a rebooting of capital, right? So the role of the third industrial revolution, microelectronic revolution, computer revolution, information revolution, and of course, cybernetic revolution. Cybernetic revolution, as of course, we, we have through um, uh, discussions within between cyberneticians about a possibility of this really complex assemblages of different nature, of different temporalities, of different localities, etc., etc., that all can be collected together, assembled for a particular act of war, even they are located, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in different remote parts of the world. So, and here, of course, we have a uh, really capitalist um, uh, competition, right? So, uh, for example, things like Facebook tried in India with uh, free basics is an access to the internet by through Facebook, right? So controlling, so, so big companies become a huge important actors in, um, in cyber war. So now we are not speaking only about states, right? Even though states are involved, but big corporate entities are maybe even more, uh, maybe even more active participants today in all these tensions, right? So uh, if before the war could be between state and state, and today we think about sometimes state and a corporation, or a corporation, another corporation, and a random actor, right? So we have different groups. So we have like big entities, almost like state or cor corporate level. And we have, we have like some soul hackers also participating in this. We have groups of users, we have user audiences, populations, those um, kind of um, using different platforms. Uh, um, and we have like this uh, tension fight for new user audiences uh, as big corporations now attempt to do. Uh, 
So things like, uh, for example, the station, tension of uh, Huawei between US and China and the arrest of one of the uh, key people of, uh, of Huawei in Vancouver, Canada, was also a really uh, symptomatic of this new uh, attempts to redefine um, world power. Uh, I probably uh, want to mention also another example um, of a cyber war that shows how certain ideas, uh, how certain uh, search systems, for example, are also important in, in terms of impacting what people think and what they uh, allow people to do. Um, this is a snapshot from a video uh, captured um, on um, uh, showing how uh, in November 20, uh, on November 25, 2018, a Russian Coast Guard uh, captured a Ukrainian ship going through the Kerch Strait. And if you are not familiar with this um, complex uh, relations, right, so after the occupation of Crimea by Russia, so parts, they, they claim also parts of the sea, parts of the waters, right, and the Kerch Strait uh, as uh, like Russian territory. And it's very interesting because um, we could, like it could be said that according to Ukrainian side, they were going through their waters. According to the Russian side, they said it's now our waters. But if you look at, for example, um, how this territory is displayed by the search systems that are used by many different people in the world, you could also see that there is no consensus there either. For example, here I made, uh, I looked at the border between Crimea and Ukraine through, from ne ne Netherlands and through uh, the IP address there, and you can see how the border is displayed in the blotted line, which means contested. If you look from Russian IP address, there is the border, and it's a very straight line. And if you look through Ukrainian IP address, there is no border at all, right? So in a sense, here we have, we deal with a search system, with Google Maps, right? So which is supposed to be a universal um, uh, device. However, here we can see it's completely ideological and also serves certain clients' interest, just like like on the market, right? So it, it makes the client happy. It the kind of guesses if it's someone from the Russian uh, territory, then of course, probably this person wants to see the border. If it's someone from Ukrainian territory, they probably don't want to see the border. But people in fact consult these services in order to understand what is the world's consensus about this, right? But what this Google Maps does, it not only creates certain understanding, but it actually creates more misunderstanding, right? So it's you could see uh, here Google Maps exhibits it itself as a completely commercial software. And when um, Ed Parsons, who um, oversees these uh, technologies, one of the key technologies for Google, uh, dealing with maps, it's interesting when he was asked about the situation, that's what he answered. He said, like, I guess naively, perhaps we hoped we could have one global map of the world that everyone used, but politics is complicated. In some countries, we are legally obliged to represent borders in particular uh, ways. We want to represent the complexity of the world, and that sometimes leads us to the, these awkward situations, right? So in a sense, uh, when people uh, criticize um, uh, Facebook or Google for contributing to production so-called echo chambers, 
for uh, just like it's done for uh, you know like on commercial uh, for commercial purposes, right? So to creating its own buyer, to creating a person with its own uh, opinion, certain groups that facilitate certain opinions to sell them certain ideas better, right? So we can see that it's true as uh, these technologies do contribute to production of these echo chambers for a variety of reasons. One of them, and the main of them, we think, is of course that, that they are commercial and they act as commercial. However, this commercial technology also are part uh, of this entire cyber war complexity, this tension. And this particular example really leads me to this notion, and I will just end by uh, shortly, briefly introducing the notion that I am trying to develop uh, building on the work of Jody Dean, American political economist who also wrote a lot about uh, capitalism and communication, etc. So back in early 2000s, I believe it's in 2005, she published a fantastic article which is called Communicative Capitalism, Circulation and Flo uh, Foreclosure of Politics. And this article, she uh, actually introduced this notion, communicative capitalism, saying that uh, online it's more uh, about commerce now, right? So not about politics because when, uh, again, the cyberspace was imagined and presented in the 90s and early 2000s, it was a kind of imagined as a space for new politics where people could have uh, their acts of free speech and uh, really make uh, government officials respond and uh, etc. So internet and the space it allowed felt like a tool as, as an important tool for influence. However, what you notice around 2005 is this total commercialization of that space where all these acts were weakened by the fact of uh, um, different corporate politics of uh, social media, right? So where they were more interested in squeezing certain values from this discussion uh, than uh, in fact having, uh, allowing any impact for, on politics. And so it is drawing on this discussion, I want to introduce another notion uh, and talk about communicative militarism, that having all this, uh, what Jody Dean already uh, explained, discussed here, that in addition to this change of this uh, commercialization of political communication, right? So now we also witness militarization of political communication that did not substitute uh, of course, the intention to commercialize it and squeeze certain value, but in fact, it goes along with that. And that particular situation, I think, is very important and super disturbing because uh, the same tools are used for commercial acts and military acts for changing people's opinions and propaganda and all sorts of uh, psychological warfare and for selling certain products. And just to uh, uh, very briefly, I will just jump to uh, the end of my slides and use this another kind of also very symptomatic um, uh, case to illustrate this tendency. You probably heard about um, uh, Christopher Bailey, who was uh, a leaker, who revealed the information about how Cambridge Analytica was involved um, in uh, changing the opinion of American voters. And uh, he, for, for one, uh, he, he even claimed that he made Steve Bannon's psychological warfare tool, right? And then realizing what he had done, he became a whistleblower and let the world know about all these undercover strategies. But what's interesting, after uh, he presented the world all the situation and generated this very important discussion, uh, we know that uh, a couple of years ago, 
uh, he was hired by H&M. And that precisely illustrates what I was saying, how the same technology, the same knowledge, sometimes even the same people, the same strategies, the same toolkit is used for warfare of any way, right? So psychological warfare or propaganda or information warfare and for selling products, right? So the person could change jobs from Cambridge Analytica to H&M very easily from political campaign to uh, selling some fashionable, fashionable goods. And I think uh, with this illustration, I will probably add my uh, end my presentation today. And this is my last slide. And we can come back to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Svetlana, for the great presentation. I'm sure we all learned a lot from your enlightening and provocative presentation and perspective. So we'll now start the Q&A session. We will make two rounds. In the first one, I'm posing a couple of questions, and afterwards we will open to other people that are watching us. Your book presents an account of how these new technologies, information and communication technologies, render war as a veritable fog machine, or even you mentioned the fog of cyber war. Uh, nowadays, we see a revival of these debates regarding the impact of AI on war and the ethical discussion of on fully autonomous intelligent weapons. Could you comment further on these ideas? As far as my second question, it deals with uh, current competition. In the book, you criticize the premise that we would be experiencing a new Cold War, stressing the fact that there are neither two societal models nor two different modes of production in competition. You affirm that contemporary competition looks much more like great power competition from the 19th century. Hence, you define this competition as intercapitalist. I completely agree with you on that. However, I was curious over the fact that you mentioned Lenin several times, but you don't mention imperialist competition nor imperialist rivalry. Is it just a question of more near terminology? Or is learning analysis on imperialism not adequate to reading the current relations? There is also a heated debate regarding whether China is an imperialist country. What's your position on that question? So thanks for very much, Svetlana, and you now have the floor. So first one on the fog of war. So as we know, this fog of war uh, is, is a very old notion, right? So it, it uh, comes from the 19th century theories so far. So, and it's interesting to see how with every update of militarisms and kind of uh, war making, how new technology contributes to producing something as fog of war, right? So it's a very strategic and tactical in some ways uh, way of uh, misleading the enemy, right? So uh, it's not because very often we would think about like contemporary, uh, uh, right? So some, some people would may say that some long time ago when uh, wars were announced and everything was so direct, right? So things were more visible than now, but it's not so. The, fog of war is a very old a strategy for misleading the enemy. And with cyber war, we were also trying to think about how the current technologies that are used in um, uh, war making, in cyber warfare, also uh, do something like fogging, producing more fog, right? Because uh, uh, today we also think and often talk about some kind of new opacity. Everything is transparent. But in fact, uh, this fog of war can be strategically produced 
by certain groups, but it can also be random. And we need to understand that the high transparency that today's technology allows, right? For example, for surveillance and stuff like that. At the same time, uh, mm, we have situations when airplanes disappear and nobody knows when they are gone, right? So we are living in the age of uh, kind of new opacity. That's one thing. But very correctly, you mentioned the role of AI technologies, etc. So in the new technologies of surveillance, in the new technologies of extraction, new value, right? So of matching and bringing new data together for different purposes, commercial or military. So we delegate a lot of this work to algorithms, to uh, machines. And even as the technologies themselves uh, uh, speak about it, sometimes and oftentimes it, not, it is not very clear how certain assumptions are made by machine. So in this case, I think we even didn't speak much about that in the book, but already thinking after this book, uh, looking at the new work that is now done on AI, for example, the most recent book uh, published by Kate Crawford, The Atlas of AI and etc. So all the researchers draw attention to how algorithms work as black boxes and uh, what it means for certain, you know, important acts and, and uh, even such acts as cyber warfare. So what, what again want to say is that certain acts of war as a, as, as a strategic uh, uh, planned misleading, misinformation, all different sort of capac uh, capacity. Some of it is completely random and not planned. And there is something else that where people would like to have more transparency, but cannot at the moment have uh, because algorithms work in a certain way. And these are very different types of production, of fog production, and they are all very typical. They all uh, participate. They all create the complexity of cyber war as a certain distributed event. And because it is a distributed event, right? So it happens in uh, within a wide temporal and spatial framework. So um, yeah, uh, it uh, do, mm, Creation of fog is, is one of the uh, kind of like, it's very important aspects. The second question was, uh, again, yes, about um, mm, the new Cold War, uh, so to speak, right? And uh, potential for seeing old and new imperialisms. Um, I think it is very important to talk, to continue to talk about new imperialisms today. Um, some cases, I think, still deserve more studying. And for example, um, uh, this year, I am uh, studying a study group that will focus specifically on China and India to explore this particular question because some of the situations that sometimes claimed as imperialist in China's action, I don't see so, and others I see. So I think it's, it's very complex and probably each case should be taken separately and we have to see certain reasons what and how something is or is not imperialist. And uh, China cases especially um, deserve a careful studying because of this huge discourse around China and opposition to China, right? So in a certain way, we are quite impacted to this opposition to China. And I want to kind of like break through certain narratives and work with Chinese scholars, Chinese researchers in China and in different parts of the world in order to understand the specifics of many different cases. 
Uh, and that's kind of like well, basically a new project. Another new project that I'm doing uh, related to this is a book, a collection, which is called um, um, Cyber What Topology. And topology is that, of course, mathematical idea, mathematical area that studies uh, figures that change their shape but preserve their properties. And looking at how technological configurations, new additions like 5G or something else transform what we see as very complex um, uh, internet infrastructure, world internet infrastructure, right? So this infrastructure becomes more and more complex. So it has more and more pockets, more and more possibilities to hide or see something or whatnot, right? And it allows kind of for certain new ways for redistribution of the world power and control over the internet, when some countries may not be even aware that their internet or certain segments of their internet are controlled by some other groups, whether related to states or corporations or some other groups that are not related to neither states nor corporations, right? So what are these kind of ways to, uh, of, of control, et cetera, et cetera. And here, when, when, when we study with a whole team that I have, um, the cyber water apologies is one of the research um, streams in the Digital Democracies Institute at the School of Communication. Um, and with my team who works on cyber world apologies, which will also be a collection, as I mentioned, we actually think about how old colonial and imperialist strategies are embedded, encoded in certain internet infrastructures and whether and how they survive or change under different technological reconfigurations of the internet assemblage. And in many cases, uh, with, with this um, strategy allows to keep the discussion about imperialism and even colonialism alive, because the internet is again uh, a very complex infrastructure, and infrastructure is basically a palimpsest, right? So it's composed of different layers. It, one layer is embedded on another layer, right? So even when we got something like uh, uh, digital currencies, and et cetera, they don't really hang in the air. They also are connected to very deep layers of the infrastructure. And technology is always manifestation of such things as colonialism, imperialism, et cetera. They inherit a lot from those times where they were developed. And the, even, the, even though the internet was developed in the 20th century, it is very much connected to the older infrastructures of telecommunication, railroads, and whatnot, right? That had very important imperial impact and imperial ideology. So, and still let me kind of basically lead to a question to uh, finalize my answer to your question. So it's still a question for us because I think it's all ongoing research to identify the ways of how exactly colonial or imperial strategies are embedded and continue to act out in certain, within certain even high-tech technologies today. And how all the things also impact the relation between different countries, geopolitics, etc economies. Thank you, Svetlana, for your answers. I think uh, the lines of research that you mentioned are fundamental for us to understand the contemporary deadlocks that we are experiencing in everyday life, and also and especially for peripheral zones. So um, now we'll have a second round of questions. This come from the public who are the research members of our groups. And we have a couple of questions we hear and I'm gonna read them for you. Rodrigo Santael, he says, in the pandemic, we have considerably increased the use, including peripheral countries, 
of platforms for the exercise of labor functions, especially in education. This multiplies the quantity and quality of the data made available on the web. In the book, you mark 2005 with the emergency of Web 2.0 as a milestone in cyber war. In this context, could, you, could the contemporary pandemic be another milestone in terms of development of cyber war's tools and mechanisms? So this is Rodrigo's question. Now I have a couple of questions from Edemilson Paraná. He says, I would like to hear from you how the best theoretical methodological tools in your view on dealing with this so obscure issue of cyber war that tends to be, by nature, somehow conspirational. That is, how to better filter and work upon evidence on investigating so is this so sneaky issue. And he, he also says, I, will, I also would ask you to comment on the impact on the prospects of these new cyber war trends on internal class struggle involving workers, movements, citizens, the people, and especially the necessity for new forms of resistance and popular struggle. So these are our questions, and you have, now have the floor, Zitlana. Thank you. The questions are very important and complex. I'll try to offer some thoughts. Uh, first question is about this current pandemic situation. I don't know if ever we enter post-pandemic state, <laughs> just because, as I mentioned, I believe certain technologies and technological practices and new technological configurations that were designed, created, and set during the pandemic time will be carried on probably uh, after uh, this particular crisis um, uh, leaves us, right? So therefore, I do think I, as many academics, I am incredibly concerned by what has been happening and this uh, push uh, to adopt certain technologies, very often, even regardless, many warnings from those who looked at their terms of use and identify many issues that have to do with how these technologies uh, deal and treat personal data or group data and whatnot. And it's interesting, you know, yeah, so as I mentioned, we will probably observe how all these uh, practices remain very active um, because this push was very strong and many of us found so many different uses in, in this, right? Also myself, I'm really looking to the time when we can do more events face-to-face, -face, et cetera, et cetera. And I will give you a, quite an interesting example <clears throat> how um, in my school, in my university, um, our school of communication is a very active kind of um, politically minded um, um, uh, department. And when we are, were kind of like forced basically to use Zoom, we um, did our own investigation and the group of faculty members wrote a fantastic description of why, and like targeting every problem of Zoom, giving the evidence with many reports that actually exist, even though they are so distributed, right? So it takes time to find them everywhere. And we produce a fantastic letter, recommendation, a warning to the university against this very strong push to Zoom. But today, of course, we live in the time of a neoliberal university that in a big way participates in this whole market, right, economy and whatnot. And of course, this letter uh, is still hanging on our school's page, but wasn't really considered by the university. So we went to work with Zoom and on Zoom, just like with this, even we didn't write it. 
But at the same time, I mean, and that's where, you know, um, this also related to another question, which asks about certain tactics and ways for, you know, carry, carrying on certain struggle. But that's how it is, right? So even though sometimes I have so much of skepticism and disbelief, and I understand how powerful those players are on the other side, but that's a kind of probably the ethical gesture is to carry on the struggle if you remain a pessimist, right? Because even though our ladder is hanging there, we know that we raised awareness of students, of the members of different departments, and so on. And I will be very happy to share actually the text of this letter with you, because I think it can be used as a certain manifesto, basically, and just for the sake of raising awareness. Because I think this awareness is basically, uh, in many cases, the most of what we can do, but it's a huge thing, right? Especially in the university, especially in education. Because as, you know, it's not, uh, I mentioned that the user is one of the layers of this very complex cyber war assemblage and way, the way how user is often used as, as a relay, as a relay that allows certain flows of information and disinformation pass through one part of the world to another, right? So users are those nodes and they are mobilized for certain events. They are mobilized for coming to the squares and they are also mobilized for sharing certain information. And in many cases, this information, of course, is shared like almost automatically, right? So user is also being automatized, right? So creating really a little cyborg without thinking, right? So operated by means of affect or something else, just, just uh, uh, et cetera. And this kind of user, the user who can be easily mobilized, easily operated, easily impacted, and at the same time complicit, with the platforms, complicit with the current state of things, is a dream of a Silicon Valley in the US and other parts of the world, right? So this complicity is one of the key features of the user, the user as it was imagined there. So that's why one of the things that I've been always wanted to do and somehow haven't done enough is basically to undo this notion of the user, to produce certain critique, to un to explain in some kind of language that can reach bigger audience how exactly this user is imagined, that the user is a place, and we all are forced in a certain behavior as users, right? So in this sense, maybe it's more interesting to act as a hacker, as someone who disobeys rather than a user who is completely uh, complicit with the system. So uh, I think that the major outcome and that one of the most important things that we as educators, as people who study these things, right, so engaging with communities, local communities where we live and just passing this message, right, so to explaining better how system works, uh, that we all, and this user is, of course, right, so the user is not called worker, but that's, again, in response to another question, right, so that's why cyber war is always a class war where a user is an abused and uh, exploited entity in many cases not being even aware of that, right? So because the ideology of Silicon Valley tells always something about activity, tells a lot about uh, power that these platforms give, give us and so on and on, right? And we know, of course, a number of important powerful events when people mobilized for certain action, right, from BLM to uh, different protests all over the world, right? So, and these are things important to do, and we uh, probably should be, <laughs> should uh, keep being engaged and etc. but at the same time, 
knowing of how the system works and knowing about system of protection is also very important because we know even after each protest, there are new ways of how the state um, finds new ways of controlling, arresting, following and surveilling people. And there is another thing in the book that I, I think uh, it is important to understand. Uh, it's about how governments appropriate certain strategies designed by active users, designed in, in the course of every protest, every protest, every so-called color revolution uh, is associated with invention or disruption of, of certain platform, right? Or a combination of different technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how people easily, easier mobilized or um, achieve certain tactic uh, goal, uh, tactical goal, but at the same time, we also see over and over again how governments very immediately learn from what protesters invented and hijack basically this new technology for their new parts of surveillance. In a certain time, and it's very upsetting to see how ourselves, we sometimes give government new tool. And I don't know what, how, what is the way out here, right? So it's just basically probably um, learning more, making opposing certain gestures, bringing awareness, and uh, trying not to become complicit users who cannot survive mentally without Facebook because we also know it's a psychological dependence, it's symptomatic, right? So to be a, a user means to having ha this dependence. So maybe we should on our end, like uh, each of us, um, learn how to uh, keep a certain distance from technology that allows us, that makes us so dependent uh, and use this time for something else. That would be my answer to both questions. Thanks. Thank you, Svetlana, for your answers. So just to let you know, we are posting all written material associated with the seminar uh, in the website for of, uh, one of our research groups with NETS. So all written materials, slides, and of course the letter will be posted on the next website, Núcleo de Economia, Tecnologia e Sociedade. We'll also post um, in the comments, we'll post the link for the letter, and we can also translate it to Portuguese and make available for our public. So since we had already two uh, question and answer sessions, I'm going to pass to you for final considerations, if you'd like to do so. Uh, I will just probably thank you all, and I just want to invite you uh, to conversation, right? So, you know, uh, Brazil is one of my big interests, right? So, because I'm quite interested in the entire uh, history of BRICS, and uh, we constantly think about it in my little think tank with my colleagues, etc. So, if any of you would like to work more closely or join our working groups, it's all open, and uh, we will will start a new edition in August and I would be very happy to share this invitation with you because we actually do not have people from your part of the world and it's very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation and we hope in the future we can meet face to face, maybe here in Brazil or who knows Canada and we hope to further our discussions and debates and we would like again to thank you so much for being here with us today. Bye-bye.